Hi everybody, welcome to this talk with Gary Broad. My name is uh, Mari Raven and I'm going to be your hostess tonight. Uh, I'm from the community or the website called invested.dk and invested.dk is one of the largest communities in, uh, in Denmark for private investors. Today we also have people joining us from Norway. Um, we've sent out an invitation to our sister site, daytrader.no. And also we have people from Gary's community here. So we're a big bunch of uh, citizens from around the world. And that makes me so happy. So today we're going to hear from Gary from Deep Knowledge Investing. And we're going to hear about three winning tips for the market right now. And Gary, I've been talking and talking. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself? And yeah, thanks. welcome to the talk. I'm so happy you're here. Thanks, my thanks for having me. We've enjoyed all of our discussions with um, Invested DK. So glad to have your Norwegian friends on the line as well. And, and one of the things that we love about your community is I get the best questions from your people. I get more questions, better questions, thought-provoking questions. You really have a great investor community and I'm so glad to be speaking to you. Um, and so glad that some of you have cho chosen to join us at Deep Knowledge Investing. We provide actionable investment ideas and timely market commentary. Um, we've been early and predictive on things like inflation, on hedging for higher interest rates, on shorting the market this year. And so I, I think our subscribers have done really well and we're so happy to be working with you now. We are too. We're so honored that you want to spend time with us. and. Thank you so much for speaking so kindly about our community. We're we very we are very happy about that. <laughs> so I'm trying not to do any tongue twisters here. I'm um, my native language isn't English, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, for the guys just joining now, you can ask questions during this talk. If it uh, fits in 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 the talk, I'll ask Gary them. Otherwise, we'll uh, ask. Have, Otherwise, we have time in the in the end for questions. So, Gary, I've done my introductions. Let's hear what would you have for us today. All right, great, Mai. So, where would you like to start? I know we've got questions on oil, on inflation hedges, metals, commodities, stock picks. Where do you think mm. is the best place to start? Well, let's start with uh, with gold because one of my questions were uh, about the the ban, the sa sanction that's uh, that's against Russia right now that they can't export any any gold. So I think that's maybe two days old, a couple of it's it's most recent. Yeah. So so for the for for taking something really recent, what are your 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 thoughts about that? Yeah, so thanks for asking about that. That uh, information came out, I think, last Saturday. We had a post up on our blog on Saturday. If any of you want uh, more detail on this in writing, um, it's deepknowledgeinvesting.com. If you click on the research tab, that post is not paywall. But my, the key issue here is the United States, I think, has good intentions in sanctioning Russia. Uh, we believe that the Ukrainian people should be free and independent and should be able to choose their own leaders and chart their own course. Um, if I had my way, the Russians would leave Ukraine right now, and that would be the end of it. So I think we have good intentions here, and the United States has attempted to sanction Russia, and we've kindly been joined by our friends and allies in Europe, um, also with the same good intentions. The problem is that the sanctions have not been well designed. So mm. I, I think we were trying to do a good thing. I think our European friends and allies were trying to do a good thing but we've designed the sanctions poorly. So the problem is that the news on Saturday is that we're going to ban, as you said, exports or sale of Russian gold. Hmm. The issue is there's no such thing as Russian gold. There's simply gold. Okay. And there are, most of the world has not joined us hmm. in these sanctions, including some very large countries like China, India, Brazil, these are countries with a very substantial amount of GDP. Um, and every country on the planet imports, or sorry, pardon me, uses oil 
Um, fertilizer is very important. Russia exports food. So there are things that, you know, that the Russians have that other people will want, including gold. Um, there are roughly 150 countries in the world who have not joined us in these sanctions. And so what, what was announced is the Russians won't be allowed to export gold. And mm. that is factually incorrect. What it means is that a very small number of countries, including the United States and the European Union and NATO, will not be buying Russian gold. But that doesn't stop the Russians from selling their gold to 150 other countries who can then import it, melt it, recast it, and put another stamp on it, at which point it ceases to become Russian gold and is simply gold. Mm. Yeah. Okay, but so I know that one of your your um, one of your ways of hedging was, and we talked a little before this uh, before this webinar, uh, was actually gold and silver. And I've done uh, several talks where we both had a guy who has an investment firm where you can buy gold, and we have several people um, saying that gold is a really good way of hedging right now. So what's your what's your take on on that? Yeah, we, we agree. We've been mm. telling people since last November that inflation yeah. is a gigantic problem. Um, I don't know exactly what they were saying in Europe, but our chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, kept referring to inflation as transitory, um, mm. which is a fancy word for temporary. Um, it is a huge problem. It's not transitory. It's not temporary. We identified that. Um, the real issue is that uh, and I don't know what the statistic is for Europe uh, or for the euro, but in the United States, 80% of all dollar supply has been created in the last two years. And that's a huge problem. The, the United States Federal Reserve was printing $6 trillion at a time with the push of a button. And so there was this huge increase in money supply that wasn't accompanied by an increase in GDP, an increase in production, an increase of creation or mining of precious metals or commodities or anything that has value, the, the Federal Reserve just decided, hey, guess what? Today we have six trillion more. Mm -hmm. um, and that went on for a couple of years. And so anytime you have what we had here, which is a gigantic increase in the money supply accompanied by a decrease in economic activity. Remember all the COVID shutdowns that everybody mm -hmm. had when no one was working and people were yeah. sheltering at home? Well, what you end up with is more dollars, or in your case, more euros, chasing fewer goods, and mm. you have inflation. And so the thing that is really important about gold, and, and um, I was actually just reading a book called The Bitcoin Standard, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce the name. I think it's Seifedon uh, Amos, uh, and please <laughs> forgive me. I've just mispronounced his name. Um, but he talks about the flow to stock ratio, which sounds really fancy, but it's actually very simple. Yeah. There's a large amount of gold supply that exists in the world. And the amount that can be produced in any given year is only, you know, a, a couple percent of that. So unlike the US dollar or the euro, where a central bank can just create a huge increase, you can't have a huge increase in the amount of gold in the world. Gold has been used as money for thousands of years. It's been used hmm. as money throughout the entire world. It can't be created from other substances, or at least not economically. Um, and you have mining that's maybe one and a half, two percent of the stock every year. And so you don't have large increases in the supply. And that's why gold is a really good hedge for inflation as dollars or euros become worth less. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, in the last few months about how the dollar is very strong. And I'm sure you guys have read that and you're aware of that. And here's the issue I have with that analysis. It's technically true if you're a foreign exchange trader. So if you're trading foreign exchange and earlier this year you had bought the dollar and shorted the euro or um, you know the pound sterling or the Canadian dollar, you'd be mm. doing really well. But 
I would just ask you, you know, do, how many Americans do you think want to own euros? We don't. People want to own things like food, housing, mm. fuel. And by mm. the way, it's it's the same thing in Europe. So if you are living in Europe, you don't want to buy dollars. You want to buy food and housing and fuel. And my, let me ask you, has the cost of those things, of the price of those things in Denmark gone up? There, our inflation is high, and I saw your inflation was also the highest in 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 uh, in many years. So yeah, the prices of of those goods and and commodities they've they've gone up, and your inflation is is high as well, right? Yes, and yeah. and our inflation is understated. I don't mm. I don't know how Europe is keeping track, but mm. uh, if we accounted for inflation in the way that we did back in the late 70s, early 80s, which was the last time inflation was mm. this high. Um, I, I think the real inflation number is double the current rate. I think 15, 16 percent is oh. the real number, which is huge. Why do you think that? Well, so I'll point to a couple mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. The most important is if you go back to the late 70s, early 80s, the United States, when we calculated inflation, went with the actual cost of housing. They call it shelter. It's one third of the index. Mm. And the actual cost of housing in the United States the last couple of years has been up in the neighborhood of 20%. And there are all kinds of indexes, things like Zillow, the Case-Shiller Index. Um, there are all kinds of rental indexes that show the cost of housing is up about 20%. And mm. back in the late 90s, I want to say 1998, um, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics changed the shelter component of the calculation to be... Uh, what they call owner's equivalent rent, which is they went to homeowners and they said, if you were to rent out your house, how much money could you get for it? And because people don't know and they don't typically put their house on the market and they would they'd sort of pick the same number they used last year. And so mm. if you look at those charts, the chart of actual housing costs looks like this. It goes up a huge amount and the owner's equivalent rent is very, very flat. And so there's a gigantic difference between them, and that's a third of the index. A second place where I know they're fooling around with the numbers is food inflation. They've been trying to tell okay. us for months that food inflation was 8% or 10%. Has anybody been in the supermarket in the last year? Tell me your food prices are only up 10%. It differs on different um, on different foods, but uh, I think butter butter was up 20%. Right. And, and butter is a pretty essential thing, but it, it differs. Right. So if you yeah. take a look, there's a United Nations um, index that mm. tracks world food prices, and that's up by roughly one third. So mm. Americans tend to eat a very high protein, expensive diet. We eat a lot of beef, chicken, pork, fish. Um, we do have, you know, fresh vegetables. The things that we eat here tend to be expensive. So is it reasonable to assume that in food inflation here is only one third to one fourth of what it is in the rest of the world? I, I just don't believe that. Um, mm -hmm. The price of beef has doubled. We had bad cases of bird flu here, the H1N1. Uh, it's, we've killed, I think it's 15 or 20 million chickens. Oh, we've okay. killed millions of turkeys. The price of eggs, I think, has tripled. Mm. Um, and so there are huge food shortages and it's going to get worse. Mm. So I just don't believe that number. I think if you start adjusting for real inflation and what people are really experiencing, I think the loss of purchasing power of the dollar in the last year has been about 15, 16 percent. Mm. I would be shocked if it were very different. Uh, with the euro, but you guys can tell me maybe your, um, you know, maybe your community has a view on that. I'd be interested in it. Hmm. Yeah, you guys, you're welcome to to bring your views in, or if you have any questions, of course. So what you're saying, Gary, is it that do you don't believe that the dollar will will keep having a strong position uh, when it comes to forex trading? No, I I. I think there are people who are experienced foreign exchange traders mm -hmm. and they'd be the ones to talk to on that. For mm. for the people listening, mm. 
I don't have a point of view on whether the dollar should trade stronger or weaker against the euro or the yen or the Canadian dollar or the pound sterling or anything that goes into those indexes. Um, mm -hmm. That's really not my area of expertise. My opinion is that the dollar is decreasing in value against the kinds of things that we want to buy, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to buy euros. Most Americans don't want to buy euros. What we want to buy are things like cars and housing and furniture, clothing, and food and fuel are big ones. And I hmm. think we're facing a huge loss in purchasing power um, against those things. And if we were able to buy euros cheaply, but then those euros, as you said, they're not buying as much food or fuel or shelter hmm. or clothing, the kinds of things you need, then it's not really helpful. So I think people looking at it in that way um, they might be making money as foreign exchange traders, in which case, great, good for them. Um, but I, we're, we're not looking at it that way. And that's why mm. we're buying things like gold and silver, um, mm. because the purchasing power of the dollar against goods and services is declining. And that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. There is um, there's a question here, and um, it takes us a little back to to gold. And I hope it's okay that uh, I ask yeah. it now. I I sensed that you were in the end of, of what you were talking about, but it's from uh, Ronnie, and he he wants to, he wants to hear. Do you want to give your opinion of Bitcoin versus gold? Yeah, I I think the answer is to own both. Um, mm -hmm. Basically. Uh, gold is a great hedge against inflation, and it's something that we own now and we think people should own now, especially if you're worried about the loss of purchasing power of your assets. Bitcoin is actually deflationary. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that we like about Bitcoin is that it can't be controlled by a state. Uh, national actors, state actors don't have control over it. Um, and the reason I say it's deflationary is because right now there are roughly 19 million Bitcoins in existence. There will be a total of 21 million. So the last 2 million will be mined over the next 100 to 150 years. And the there every roughly every four years or so, there's an event called the halving. And what that means is that the same amount of effort or work or computing power that goes mm -hmm. into mining one Bitcoin gets doubled. The reward that you get for solving the equation to get a Bitcoin gets cut in half. And so because it takes more effort to mine the incremental Bitcoin, it's actually deflationary. Um, for people who are nervous about cryptocurrencies, we understand that. There are people mm -hmm. who say, wait, this is new. We don't know how it'll all work out. That's a totally relevant and understandable concern. Uh, I, I can understand why people wouldn't trust a new form of money. Uh, the thing that I would say to those people is take a 50 basis point, position half a percent, one percent, put it away and forget about it because it'll work or it won't. If it works, you'll make enough money on that 50 basis point or one percent position that you'll be glad you did. And if it doesn't work, you know, then you'll lose half a percent. And, mm -hmm. you know, we never want to lose money, but you're you're taking a very simple bet on something that, if it works, would work in huge size. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's not either, it's... It's both. It's, it's both, yeah. 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 Um, and we were also talking, I know one thing we haven't talked about yet, and there is, uh, there's 10 minutes left of, uh, of the talk, and then we will have the questions. One thing we were talking about uh, was also oil. And um, in the pre-interview, I asked you, so uh, what oil companies do you see potential in now? Yeah. Because so, I know oil. I'm oh, sorry. I just no, wanted no, to say, you know, yeah. oil was also one of the ways of uh, of hedging um, that you would uh, recommend, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the fact is, energy needs are not decreasing. Mm. 
Mm. And so the, the the human race needs a certain amount of energy, and it's really required for economic development. Uh, I saw yesterday, and I, I apologize, I can't remember what country, but the leader of mm. an African country came out and said, hey, you know, you guys want us to um, use alternatives and renewables. He said, we, we need to develop uh, our, our country. He said, we need fossil mm. fuels for that. And, you know, I understand that. They want energy dense um material in order to increase the living standards of their people and no one wants to volunteer to live in a low energy environment and so the demand for energy is not going down um but the supply of it is a bit of a problem the situation in russia has uh, created a problem as everybody in europe is well aware you don't need me to explain that oh. um we also have issues here in the United States where uh, the current administration is very energy unfriendly. They're closing down pipelines. They're not permitting. And, you know, the, the current president ran for office telling the oil companies that he was going to put them out of business, at which point they said, OK, then we won't ever build another refining plant. And one of the issues that we have here in the United States isn't just a lack of access to the crude oil, it's refining and processing. And by the way, that's one of the big problems in Russia too. Russia mm. didn't run out of oil, they didn't run out of crude, but their ability to process and get processed fuel out of the country has been impaired. So mm. basically you have this supply demand imbalance that's raising prices. And you also have the fact that due to the petrodollar, at least for now, and it's changing, but due to the petrodollar, all oil is priced in dollars. And because of that, the inflation that we talked about is reducing the value of the dollar and increasing the value of fuel against it. Um, let's go to specific suggestions on that. We like oil companies that are very high quality, and already operating permitted wells. And the reason we say that is because uh, due to environmental concerns, it's become from a government and regulatory point of view, very difficult to get new wells permitted. So we like going with well-run companies that have proven reserves that they're already drilling, that they're already producing. They don't need additional regulatory help on that. Uh, for the people on the call who want a list of names and tickers, here we go. We like EOG, EPD, PCG, and XOM, which is, of course, ExxonMobil. Um, and then one other company that we would suggest that people take a look at, hmm. it is not technically an oil company. It's a land leasing company that is closely tied to the oil drilling business, is Texas Pacific Land Trust. TPL. Uh, be aware that it's a complicated company. It's held as a, a trust. So there may be certain legal issues that people have with that. But um, there is some, I think, high quality activism on the name. Horizon Kinetics owns a gigantic amount of that stock and they're agitating for what we believe to be some positive changes. Uh, all of that information that I just gave you is publicly available. And mm. uh, because there is somebody who's an employee of Horizon Kinetics on the board of advisors of Deep Knowledge Investing, um, I prefer not to take questions on that mm. name. The only thing I'll tell you is that um, everything I know about the company is available publicly and everything I've just told you is available publicly. Um, I, I just don't want to discuss it in a way that might look inappropriate, even though we don't have any um, improper information on the name. Okay, thank you, Gary, thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, so we still have a time to spare. I think um, I've asked a question. I just want to uh, give the viewers an opportunity to just ask um, any questions that you might have. So we've talked about gold, we've talked about silver, we've talked about oil. Um, and also one of the other things we talked about, and that was also a question, but that was Bitcoin versus gold. But And you talked a little about mining, but we also talked a bit yesterday um, about Bitcoin. Um, and what are your like opinion about that? And 
and how to invest in um, how to invest in that is it mainly bitcoin or how do you see any potential in other uh, crypto val uh, val uh, cryptocurrencies that's the yes word. Yeah. okay <laughs> so there are people who are you know really great crypto experts and they spend a lot of time trying to figure out which of the alts coins or small cryptocurrencies will become big and if they guess right they make a ton of money um that's not the business that we're in we're focused on bitcoin it's it's the apex cryptocurrency it's the one with the largest market cap it's also being handled differently most cryptocurrencies are being managed in a way where they're very focused on um commerce bitcoin they're trying to position it and i think intelligently as a store of value they're really trying to make it like digital gold which is something that we like about it um owning your own bitcoin is not that complicated the it's you can easily find out how to do that uh, and store your own coins and that's a great way to do it for those of you who want a an easier option you can actually buy bitcoin at a discount through the grayscale bitcoin trust the ticker on that is gbtc um but please be aware that that trust which should the net asset value should be um very close to the value of bitcoin there are some fees on that um but the trust at times is traded at a premium and sometimes at a discount right now it's trading at a large discount the um the grayscale company is trying to get the trust converted into an etf um, an exchange traded fund if they do that the fund will trade at net asset value that's all a fancy way of saying they're fighting a regulatory battle with the u.s securities and exchange commission if they win it that discount will disappear and so basically we think that buying bitcoin through gbtc is you have two ways to win one is if the value of bitcoin goes up the other is if they win the regulatory battle and are able to convert mm -hmm. to an exchange traded fund um so that's why we like it the one thing that i would tell people is if you are buying that you need to please have a long time frame because these things can trade at discounts or premiums for years. So if you're going to buy Bitcoin and hold it and you're going to buy Bitcoin through that trust and hold it in that way, have a long time frame. This is not a day trading suggestion. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Gary. Um, yeah. I I don't have any more questions actually. Um, so I would like, uh, is there anything uh, you would like to to share with our community? Um, and also, people, this is your um, opportunity to just ask questions if you want that. Um, and I I, I just want to say like sometimes I look to the side and it's not because I'm. Yes, it is because I am distracted. I have a puppy in here, so <laughs> I just want to make that clear because some uh, sometimes I look to the side, so that's why. Um, oh, there come there was a question there. Uh, it's uh, Ronnie, and his question is: Do you have any thoughts on the housing market, Gary? Yeah, we definitely do, and and I, we've written on this extensively. So mm -hmm. what's happened is. The inflation that we talked about, that we identified back in November, has caused the United States Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. And I think you've seen that in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. The European Central Bank is raising rates too. That, of course, affects mortgage rates. And so over the last few months, we've seen mortgage rates in the United States go from two and seven eighths, just under 3%, to right around 6%, a little less, a little more than 6%. And what that's done is it's affected uh, affordability for people. And there were people who were, I mean, this is horrible. There were people who were in the process of building a house. They had, they were in contract for their dream home and it takes 12 to 18 months to build a house. And while the house was being built, interest rates went up and these people can no longer afford the mortgage on the home that they were building because the mortgage rates have changed. And hmm. so uh, we actually think Housing pricing will come down, but affordability won't. And that's a very challenging situation. So 
uh, I think we did the math on this, and and this is on the the Deep Knowledge Investing blog. Again, feel free to check it out. But we did the math for people, and I think what we calculated was if you were going to buy a house a year ago for half a million dollars, five hundred thousand um, dollars, based on the change in mortgage rates for your monthly payment to be the same, you now could only pay $375,000 for the house. So imagine that circumstance. You're the seller and the value of your house just went from half a million dollars to 375,000, you take in less, but as the buyer, you have the same monthly payment. Now, another way of thinking about that is until housing prices adjust, Let's say you were going to move, your mm. your job has caused you to move and now's the time you're going to do it. What that means is for whatever amount of money you have, you get to buy a smaller house or a house that's further away from where you want to be or a house that's less nice or with less land or it just, you're not going to be able to afford as much. And so uh, I want to point out a really interesting contradiction that we've seen because mm. Recently, there were statistics out that in the United States, the average cost of a home purchase has gone up. And so somebody's got to be listening and saying, wait, didn't you just tell us prices were going to come down? Why are they going up? And what's happened is the market is locked up at the low end and the middle of the market. In the low end of the housing market, 80% of transactions have disappeared. We're at 20% of normal transaction volume. The middle of the market, a lot of transactions have dried up as well. And so what that means is that the market is locked up and it's not clearing. And the only transactions that are taking place are at the high end of the market where people are less price sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. People who can pay $10 million for a house don't really care if they have to pay $10.5 million for a house. It's just not a big deal to them. So we've seen the statistical change um, but the market is, is locked up and what we expect is that what's going to make the transaction start to happen again is housing prices have to come down. Unfortunately, affordability won't be coming down. The higher interest rates are going to ensure that people are mm. still paying as much as they can pay. Okay. And what situation will that uh, lead to if, if, if that happens? What, uh, what it what it means is we'll have um, it'll be harder for people to qualify for a mortgage, and mm. it means sellers are going to have to accept uh, lower prices. And okay. we're already starting to see that. I, I have uh, real estate people on the board of advisors of Deep Knowledge Investing, and I'm already getting phone calls saying, "Hey, you wanted me to call you when I saw the turn in the market." He said, "That's now. We've seen it." And, mm. um, you know, this is someone, uh, Howard Friedland, who is an expert in the South Florida market, which here is a very popular, very hot market with lots of price increases over the last two years. It's a desirable area. And, mm. you know, a couple months ago, they would do an open house and 100 people would be there. And within one day, they'd get 10 offers all above the asking price. Now that that volume has disappeared and it's much harder to get people to come see a property they're getting fewer bids overall and certainly fewer bids above the asking price things are starting to get tighter okay thank you gary we have uh, five minutes left and we have um, another question here from from Ulrich. um and his question is uh, what do you think about wheat no, oh, I'm saying it like it's, uh, you know what I mean, that's <laughs> wheat. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> wheat, yes, that, not trying yes. to mispronounce here, but um, the thing you make bread with. Yes, no, with. <laughs> un un understood. And thank you. First of all, that's a great question. I, I'm so glad we're focused on it. It's a really important question. And please don't worry about pronouncing it. You don't make me say words in Danish, which would be a disaster. <laughs> your, your language is beautiful, but very hard for me. Um, some of those words I, I, I can't pronounce. I've tried. Um, okay. <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's talk about wheat, um, mm. because it's really important. So first of all, Ukraine and Russia are gigantic exporters of grains. They're gigantic mm. exporters of wheat. Um, I'm sure this won't be a surprise to anybody, but 
huge numbers of Ukrainian farmers either left the country or are busy defending their country. Oh. And one of the things we haven't seen, you know, people have said, well, we're not seeing food shortages yet. Right, because the grain that wasn't planted over the last two months, that, that doesn't, that shortage doesn't hit the market right away. That grain is due to be harvested in July, August, and September. And so when that grain that wasn't planted a couple of months ago is then not available to be harvested in August, we're going to see gigantic shortages. The other issue that we have is that um, Russia, in response to um, the United States and the European Union and NATO sanctioning them, has said, OK, we won't sell you fertilizer. And the reason that's a big deal is fertilizer is roughly 100% uh, crop yield. So mm -hmm. if you're, uh, a certain amount of land yields a certain amount of crop, adding fertilizer will double the amount of crop that you get. Well, without that fertilizer, it's much less affordable for those farmers to plant. And so as a result, not only are crop yields down, but some farmers aren't planting because the cost of diesel has gone up, the cost of fuel has gone up, but diesel in particular has been hard to get and very expensive. And without fertilizer or with very expensive fertilizer, it's not worth it for them. So we're actually seeing this very unusual circumstance where despite much higher wheat prices uh, and much higher food prices, fewer acres are being planted. We actually are going to run into a supply shortage into increasing prices. And all of this is going to be, uh, unfortunately, a huge problem. We've already seen food riots in Peru, in Sri Lanka, in Egypt. Um, yeah, hopefully that won't continue, um, but I think we can expect to see shortages and at a minimum much, much higher prices uh, in Europe and the United States. And so for everyone who's listening to this, um, just think for a minute past your uh, portfolio and think about what you need for your family. We've been advising our subscribers for months to stock up on food. Um, and if, you know, if things are tight or you don't have a ton of extra funds for that, even simple things that have a very long shelf life, like rice and beans, um, it doesn't have to cost you a lot, but now would be a really good time to have extra stores of food because if there are shortages, people will panic and we don't want anyone who's part of the deep knowledge investing community or invested DK or your Norwegian partners, anyone who's listening mm -hmm. to this, we, we don't want you to suffer. Um, so now's a good time to stock up. Okay, thank you, Gary. And um, we have uh, we have two minutes left, so I think uh, a good thing to do now would be to just sum up, and then we also have an an off. I'll I'll get back to to the communities, but if we're gonna sum up what we've uh, talked about today and. And the, I think we, we called this uh, talk three winner tips for the market right now. But I think you gave us more. So to sum up uh, what, what you're recommending um, the, our communities to, to do, um, yeah, can we sum sure. it up in, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it quick. Um, yeah. Inflation hedges, we like gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Um, if you don't want to hold these things in your home or hold your own crypto keys personally, uh, you mm. can buy um, the ETFs. You'll pay a little bit in fees. For gold, the ticker is GLD. For silver, the ticker is SLV. For Bitcoin, you can buy the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Again, please have a long time frame. GBTC is the ticker. On oil, the ticker is again EOG, EPD, mm. PCG, XOM. And it's technically not an oil company, but we also like TPL. Uh, and then another name that we've mentioned in the past, but still like, um, the stock has gone down, but the fundamental performance has been phenomenal is Coursera, C-O-U-R is the ticker. And we've written a lot on that. While the stock has gone against us because some of its competitors have done poorly, Coursera has continued to perform very well. And in an inflationary environment, they're actually providing services to people and educational credentialing to people at a much lower cost and so we like businesses like that 
Yeah, and just uh, for the people who don't do, don't know, I, I had to Google uh, Coursera. How yeah. do I pronounce it? Um, but the ticket was C O U R, right? So, what yeah. does the company uh, do? Uh, it's online education. Mm -hmm. And so everyone just, I'll be really quick with this, Mai. Mm -hmm. Everybody just think for a minute about the last couple of years mm -hmm. when uh, schools were closed and kids couldn't go to school or universities were closed. Coursera provides online education at the university and graduate school level. You can just go on and take a class in something that interests you, or you can get a full degree or maybe a certificate or advance your career by taking classes, or maybe just some of you are interested in literature mm -hmm. or statistics or mathematics or negotiation, and you just take a class because we all like learning and that's exciting and fun. Okay, thank you for clarifying what they do. Thank you, Gary. So our time here is also up. Um, and I just want to mention that Gary has been so kind to offer the, the Norwegian community and the Danish community one month free of premium content from uh, Deep Knowledge Investing. Um, you'll get an email after this uh, talk where you can read more about it. Um, but um, there's a specific page you can go to and there's a specific coupon code that you can also use. But you'll get that in an email. And Gary, so much, so very much thank you for joining us once again and giving us some um, some good tips in this crazy market. Um, yeah. I think the other day they said that in Denmark it, there was a drop of 87% in the amount of stocks bought like the private investors are um are scared although i hear a lot of experts saying like now is the time to buy up but i think a lot of new investors they are yeah they're really scared but i'm 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 um i just want to say thanks for coming and giving us good advice and having the overview of this uh, market that is pretty crazy right now Thanks, Mai. We really appreciate you having me. Um, we love talking to your community. I was, I told you, I always get the best questions mm -hmm. from, from your people. Um, so glad to be here and talking to you. For everyone who's listening, thanks so much for your time today. And feel free to come check out Deep Knowledge Investing. Come join us for a month. And if it's good for you, then stay. We have um, a bunch of Danish subscribers and we love getting their questions and having all of you as part of our community as well. So you're very welcome. Great. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Gary. Have a good night. I'll end.